Hey friends, it's MJ from the Coaches Panel. I hope you're well. He's the leader of his football club, but he's never averaged 100 over an entire season. Does that make Jai Simpkin irrelevant? Absolutely not. He could be one of the best mid-priced value options for us in 2024. And joining me in the, on this episode to talk all things Jai Simpkin, you hear him on the pod pot and you hear him regularly on the coaches panel. He's a member of both. So let's see if we can get into a third community in the fantasy landscape of content before the end of 2024. Louis, it's a pleasure to see you. Welcome to the preseason and it's good to talk about Jai Simpkin today. No, glad to be here, mate, and been enjoying the 50 so far. It's uh, such an iconic piece of uh, content these days, and uh, I think it really feeds those fantasy heads this side of Christmas who really just were itching to to select a team. And uh, yeah, Jai Simpkin, he's going to be a fascinating one in, in 2024. He's one that's been fascinating for a number of years now, but uh, due to some circumstances, which we'll discuss in a little bit, uh, he comes in serious value for us in 2024, and uh, even looking at his ownership, I know early days, it probably doesn't reflect what I, I think of him, but I know that you've got some other thoughts as well, MJ, so I think this should be a quite a fascinating discussion about Jai Simpkin, and always loving uh, talking about these players who are in that sort of 650 to 800k range, because so often year to year we see that those are the players that can really catapult you into into competing early and to competing consistently throughout the year so yeah let's get stuck into it all right well let's look at his 2023 season it's coming off the back of a super coach average of 79.3 just the 3 tons last year means his price for us just under 450,000 you hear louis just moments ago talking about this kind of high 600s to low 800s range you could contrast Supercoach to be that mid 400s to low 500s is in a similar price point. His top score last year was a 121, but that is nowhere near his career high, a 164 in Supercoach. So your boy's got some ceiling in that format. While in AFL Fantasy, four tons last year at the average of 75.7, a top score of 123. So he's got some ceiling and it's still really quite fresh in our memory. 142, a career high in AFL Fantasy and Dream Team. He's coming at a price point of just under 700000 across both those formats. It's a little bit cheaper in AF684. Louis, he's a, a fascinating player to look at because so often we look at this price range and in the fantasy community, and we'll unpack his season in a moment, we look at this range and, and sometimes it can feel like value purgatory where you go, oh, for just a hundred or 200,000 less, I could basically get myself a cash cow and I'm away for a hundred, 200,000 more. I could get myself one of the top guys in the line. And it's so tempting to get either end. What, what is it about a Simpkin type player, not just him specifically, but a Simpkin type player that for you feels like is uber relevant for what we might need in 2024? Well, just as you said, mate, he is at that uh, nice in-between area. It can be a little bit awkward, but uh, you put it quite well in how you phrase the question. You're not going to get consistent high scoring out of the rookies unless, you know, you have one that just comes out of the woodwork like a sheasel. And, you know, you're, you're paying significant money for these guys that you feel confident in scoring 100 to 105 plus each week. So, as I sort of said off the top, if you can find these guys that are in between that can represent, you know, 20 points value and bump you up to that 100 average for a fraction of the cost, uh, then it's just, you know, so imperative to really getting your fantasy season off to, to such a nice start. So if we look into his year, an average in the mid to high 70s across the formats, four AF tons, three super coach tons. You look at that and you go, the skipper's washed, he's done, his fantasy days are behind him, but nothing is ever as simple or as easy as it seems. If you look into his year, I'd probably summarize it into two words, bad luck. Everything from a health perspective went against him. There was that one match where he was flying in the first quarter. He was on track, not just for a ton, but a 150-160 across the formats, career high score, gets a finger injury, just really kind of innocuous football act ends up getting subbed out at quarter time. That's one of the games he's out. Another game gets red vested with a concussion, misses the following week, 
comes back about a month later with another concussion, isn't red vested. So you look through the numbers and you go, oh, he just got absolutely had a sandwich of a game. No, he got concussed. They'd already used their, con- their sub in that game, North Melbourne. So there's three games of data already where he is significantly given a value discount, even without having to get a discount. His average, when you take those three injured games away, 88.4 in Supercoach, 85.7 in AFL Fantasy. So, Louis, before we even contrast to what he's done in 2022 and 2021, which are really good years from a Fantasy and Supercoach perspective for us, we've already got in built into his average 10 points per game just by simply taking out games where he was out of the match before even half time. Yeah, it's spot on. And what doesn't really work in Simpkins' favour here is these injuries were spread out across the season. So, you know, quite often you might see a player do a hamstring, misses four weeks. He's already got the he's already got the kilometers in the legs. Maybe he does a little preseason. He comes back and you can sort of see why they uh continue on doing what they do or they warm up a little bit. But Jai Simpkin, it was it was spread out across the season, you know, scores are 48, 7, 23. Uh, these are scores he ha- he hasn't scored below those scores since 2021. So uh, it's definitely an anomaly for him. And uh, I think what really happened last season is injury affects continuity, affects form. He just couldn't get a run at it. And uh, when we look at his previous three seasons, you know, we go back to the COVID year, 89, 2021, 96, 2022, 96. You know, straight away, that's a three-year average of 94 points, and we can select this guy uh, what at 76. So as you said, there is a baked-in um, reflection of value almost immediately, but uh, I think what we like about Jai Simpkin is not only this, but the potential that he's been able to show at times. So I can remember back at the end of 2022, uh, he was getting some big CBA numbers and some some large time on ground too, albeit under a different coach. But this guy being 25, he, he's going to be a cog of this system. And uh, when I look at the second half of 2022, when there was a little bit of hype around him, he went at 102 post buy. So you've got a little bit more extra there. And there's a floor of 52 in that. Uh, I know not everyone in the community likes cherry picking stats, but let's remove that just for a second. And you're looking at a 109 post the buy. So this is a guy who can put together 10 games of football at a really nice clip. And that's all you're going to need from Jai Simkin to start this year uh, when he does come in representing so much value. And it feels like in a best case scenario, he could be a keeper. But in a worst case scenario, he's a guy that maybe you ride for a couple of weeks. If you don't like what you see, you, you could jump off, pivot. He's at that price where you don't have this allegiance to them you don't feel like you need to keep them in your side you don't they don't need to come good so to speak you can kind of identify the next guy and jump off and and do that pretty swiftly which is why I really like him as an option this year yeah you contrast him probably to a player like a Tom Green last year who ultimately worked out well for us Caleb Sarong Errol Goulden's and other these guys that you've picked him at this price range and salary cap outlay where you go I kind of have to be wedded to this pick now. Whereas with Simpkin, if after the opening round data, we'll talk about what opening round, even though he's not playing, how that will impact what we do with Simpkin. You see the opening round and you just go, I'll get him round one. It doesn't go his way. All of a sudden, the will set a field of 2024 that comes along. You're opening yourself up to that strategy for that very reason. You go, I just needed an asset. It's not Simpkin for Simpkin's sake. It's the asset that I was looking for. It's not him and I'm adapting. You talked about that back of 2022. It's pretty comparable for Supercoach. Eight tons that season. But that last 10 games that you alluded to, we went 102.8 in AFL Fantasy. He's gone at 97.7 in Supercoach. So yeah, a tackle. Basically the difference between the two formats. So he's shown across the formats, 95 plus, well within his scope for seasonal averages. And then you look into the years over a six, over an eight, over a 10 game week of sample. He's got triple digits within him, which to get this potential 25 plus points per game of upside is absolutely huge. I want to talk about this North Melbourne midfield role and how they structure up with you in a moment. I'm keen to get your take. Some look at those three 
of four injuries of last year and go, that's it, injury history, I'm out. Here's the thing. That's a relatively new thing for Jai. It doesn't mean it won't continue, uh, especially with multiple concussions now in his rear vision mirror. But prior to last year, you missed one game of footy for three seasons. So if you want to take this injury narrative really full on with Jai, you've got to look over more than just one year of sample. It's true and it's accurate and you've got to consider it. But to me, I look at that, Louis, and go, it's a couple of wrong place, wrong time. And then you could probably throw the finger injury in that too, which is just the tackle didn't stick, the finger did, and he gets him subbed out. So to me, I'm not really concerned about the injury history unless something pops through the months of January and February. But I want to get your take on this. There's a lot of commentary in the fantasy community at the moment about how North Melbourne's midfield structures up. I don't think there'd be any disagreement that LDU is the main man. They're building this midfield around him, his centre bounce attendance and his dominance, not just in the fantasy community, but ultimately for North Melbourne, is unquestioned. So, so we can count him as really the cornerstone of their midfield. Common ideology would be George Wardlaw. We'll get a lot of time through there. I think that's fair, but he is a second-year player who still hasn't had a full preseason ever. He spent a lot of last year rebuilding from injury. And then there's this bunch of names, Thomas, Phillips, Powell, McKercher, who they recruited through, let alone Jai Simpkin. My question to you is this. The popular conversation is that Simpkin is the guy that slides out and plays the sacrificial leadership role so that the kids get more mids. How do you see this North Melbourne side structure up through that midfield? And what is the output that might come for Jai? Yeah, it, it's going to be a hard one to predict. I, I tend to think that North Melbourne next season, or this season rather, might almost be a tale of two halves, depending on how things go. And given the context of last season, where they didn't have their coach for a majority of the year, uh, not everything went right on and off the field. And I think 2023, originally, they saw as a real development year under a new coach, Alistair Clarkson, uh, look at us, let's see how we go, stick with us. Uh, unfortunately, that didn't come to fruition. And in 2024, I think it's going to be important to really sell hope to the fans. And Jai Simpkin, he, he's, I wouldn't call him a veteran yet, although uh, within that side, he probably is towards that back end. But, mm. but he's 25, 26 years old. He's the captain of the football club. Uh, I can really see him being a large um, component of that mid th midfield throughout this year, leading those younger players. He, he's a hard worker. He's high time on ground. He's a good clearance player. He's got he's got weapons that he can teach these younger players. They're not just going to come in, hit the ground running. And uh, if they did allow that to happen, then there's a good chance that North Melbourne do get blown straight out the water again. And that's not good for anybody's development. So, I think a player like Jai Simpkin, such a high fitness as well, and shown an ability to get from contest to contest over a number of years is going to be such an integral and important part of how Alistair Clarkson sort of shapes this group and how they play their football over the, the next three, four, five years, because they are quite a young list. Uh, they don't have a whole heap of veterans um, left. Obviously, we saw Cunnington, who was at a 60% CBA rate, come out of that. Um, blokes like a, you know, a Greenwood, for example, Shields spent time in there. That That's not going to keep being the case. These younger guys are going to come in too, but I'm not sure that's going to affect Simpkin as much as it is going to um, just improve on those younger blokes that are actually coming in. It might actually help them to, to average more and including Simpkin as well, because uh, younger players need to lean on these more experienced players to, to not only get better at football, but to get the ball themselves. So I think LDU would definitely be the hit to guy, but Jai Simpkin's ability to, to go from contest to contest, to keep working, to show that work rate. And even in 2023, to show an ability to, to hit the scoreboard, which he hasn't quite done in previous years. I think, uh, there's plenty to like about Jai Simpkin. Yeah, I agree. You want to talk about midfield usage and centre bounce rate. 
Only one midfielder from North Melbourne spent more time at centre bounces last year than Jai Simpkin, and that was LDU. It was the lowest centre bounce attendance rate he'd had over the previous four years. 60% centre bounces he attended last year. 72, 79, 83 was that. And again, remember, multiple games where he was subbed out in the first quarter to half of the game. And so even with a quote-unquote more shared role through the midfield. I'm with you. I look at this midfield unit and go, the narrative that it's LDU and then kids feels low to me. I feel like Simkin is of significant value to how they develop this team. And though he might not be the main man, he is going to need to play a significant role for their development's sake. And MJ, it's impossible to predict injuries, but you know, within that midfield, it doesn't take long for Jai Simpkin to shuffle higher, higher, higher again. And even so, uh, there might be a concern of forward status. Well, how good would it be if he did get it and he was going at a 90 plus clip? Then all of a sudden, in a in a line where we're really struggling to find options at round six, you can slide Jai Simpkin, who's most likely going to be a top six forward or he'll be close enough at that stage uh, into your forward line. It gives you that added flexibility. Yeah, it really does. I think the beauty of the preseason, which ultimately can be a bad thing for the community, but it's a good thing if you look at it right, is everybody's got an opinion and nobody's wrong. That's a good thing and a bad thing. It's a bad thing when the community eats itself and goes, I'm right, you're wrong, when until we see games, both preseason and those that actually count, nobody's wrong yet. And and that's a great thing when you embrace the conversation and hear different perspectives. It's a horrible thing when it's the I'm right, you're wrong. And so when it comes to the conversation around Jai Simkin, okay, he does fade out of that midfield. He moves to the wing and half forward line. Yep, he might pick up that forward status as Louis mentioned, but the scoring's not there. Okay, well, if that narrative comes through the preseason with press conferences, intra-club, practice and preseason matches, you adjust your change of perspective. You adjust and go, okay, I thought Simpkin was going to be this, a 90-odd plus mid. He's not got that role. I'll look elsewhere. There are multitude of parachutes parallel to him, let alone a 100K up or down. So that's the thing. But if he does hold the role, what's the decision you've got to make? You say Simkin won't. Okay, that's fine. But if he does, he's shown he can go mid-90s. What do you do with that? My question to you with that, Louis, in mind is this. If he goes the mid-90s that he's shown he can do to, to low hundreds across the formats over seasons and biggest chunks of seasons, my question is this. Is a mid-90s average, as great as a return as that could be, is that going to be enough value return for us this year in a line that's got some elite top-end options and a bunch of great kids? Is a mid-90s return from Simpkin enough to make the selection worthwhile? Yeah, so you'd be looking at about 20 points there, MJ, and, you know, Generally, 20 points is about that mark, which you'd like to see. But I think ultimately it does get dictated by players priced around him and what they are also able to produce. So, you know, for an example, let's use um, Matt Crouch or an Ollie Wines. They're both priced in AF. They're both priced at about 720K-ish on average. Uh, We're looking for, what, 20 points upside out of them as well. Uh, But if they do... 30, then yeah, all of a sudden you're looking at your Jai Simpkin with 20 points and going, mm, okay, I missed that one. The caveat with that is you're not going to lose money either. And there's very likely somebody priced below his price point in AF at 680K, who you'll be able to jump down to, use your change and maybe bolster up another area or restructure something that is a little bit of a weakness in your side come round one or come round two. So that's why I really like these types of players. It Because you're not, like we said at the top of the show, because you're not tied down to them, uh, it makes it really easy to be able to make uh, a bit of a, maybe a harsh decision to to offload them early and jump onto that guy that pops. You mentioned Will Setterfield. Uh, Jack Zebel, another one at the start of the year, just went bang. And uh, 
you know, if you were somebody who traded out of a Dom Sheed, for example, early and got on these guys, then, you know, happy days, you were on your way. So, um, yeah. It's good. If you want to look at the first six weeks of North Melbourne, and there's a reason I'm talking specifically about the first six weeks and a question I'm going to ask you in a second, Louis. Giants, Frio, Carlton, Brisbane, Geelong, and Hawthorne. These are the teams that they'll be playing when four of these rounds are best 18. So hold that thought in mind as you're looking at what am I doing structurally? And there'll be plenty of conversations, not just here at the coaches panel, but any of the content creators you listen to in the preseason, as we all are genuinely just hypothetically casting out strategies and ideologies. None of us have played best 18 this early in a season. So we're all estimating and hypothetically nuancing things through. The reason I've mentioned these weeks is because Jai is available to you through every single one of them. But the challenge is you don't get to see him in opening round like you might on these other teams that have arguably comparable or better upside, maybe in different lines of defense or forward or rug. My question is this, Louis. We won't see him in opening round, but we will see others in similar price range play. An example might be a Taylor Adams, for example. I know they're different positions and you can't go apples for apples, but from a price perspective, they're comparable. They're in, they're in a range of each other, depending on the formats. What would make you fade or gain your interest on him based on what you would see in opening round? MJ, it, it's purely role for me. Uh, we always complain each year that the preseason games, there's not enough of them, and it's hard to, to be able to distinguish what is real, what's an experiment, uh, what can we read into? And, you know, we get an idea, but come round one, you do see the real stuff. And and that's when you get a better idea. The problem is that with round one or the first round that you do watch is it's such a small sample size that um, if you're looking at anything other than role, you can really quite quickly fall into, into tricking yourself. So what last year, I think Brandon Cox and Luke Ryan were the, were the top scorers of round one. And Look, Luke Ryan did okay, but Brennan Cox was just one out of the box with 20 marks there. And 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 that can happen again. I, in fact, I've got no doubt that there will be someone who pops out of nowhere with a massive score who, who goes on not to be that relevant for the rest of the year. So I think the fundamentals of preseason games still applies to that opening round. I think you need to really watch closely uh, role. It's going to have more weight this year than ever, which is fantastic. I think for that reason, again, we need to consider who's not in the team, who may be returning to the team. But uh, it, it, it's it's a bit of an awkward uh, one because it is super relevant, that opening round. But because of the sample size, it's going to be a little bit more difficult to draw conclusions from it. So you really need to back your eye this year. And if you do see somebody uh, who is in that role over round, uh, opening round, uh, and you love it, then fantastic. It's almost, you almost need to give yourself uh, a page of notes on people that you like prior to opening round and a reason why and a reason why not and reflect on that and then take that into account when you are starting your team in round one. Oh, I think that's some brilliant advice and absolutely something I encourage you as you're listening and watching to this episode to do that for yourself. The habits you're creating in January and now are going to ultimately help you hugely in late February and in March through there. So if nothing else from this conversation, definitely take the Simpkin stuff, but if nothing else, that bit of nugget that Louis just given you is absolutely going to help you with how you apply preseason and practice matches, opening round, and then the ultimate decisions you have to make heading into round one when the lock outs commence and now players you're committed to. The great thing about Simpkin is he's shown us over multiple seasons, over big stretches of time, this guy can score triple digits, which gives us enough fat on the bone to make him worth selecting. The fixture is helpful for us over those opening six weeks to give us optimum chances to get as many points on field from him as possible and to get the most price rises we possibly can during those six games. He's priced at a spot that if you pick him and it doesn't work, you're not married to the selection and you can go and get the guy that is. 
Equally, if he pops and you're not on him, you get a couple of looks and it's still not too late to jump on. If he's got that role that Louis hypothetically putting out there, and I, I tend to agree that he'll hold a heavy midfield role, he's going to be someone that at very least in the preseason, you've got to strongly consider. If he doesn't have that role, you fade interest. You drop him down your draft board. You drop him down your priority of selection because there is a plethora of parachute and parallel options within 100,000, even within 20 or 30,000 across the formats. Either way, Jai Simpkin is incredibly relevant. Draft day, where does he go? Louis, to me, that that's really fascinating to me because some will draft him based on his historical legacy of a mid-90s, Others, and probably more common than we probably care to admit, we draft very often off what they did the season prior, unless there's a high preseason bit of hype around the player. If that's the case, he's got the potential to perform like an M4, maybe even an M3, if he has a career high season. But I think M4 is probably his destiny of what he could be. But based on his average, he could get picked as late as M7. I don't think you'll go that late but I think he could be there. It feels like if you're desperate for him, M5 is where you've got to jump. So you're putting him inside the top 50 mids and you could probably though get him, depending on the format you play, even as an M6 in a lot of leagues, depending on the, the knowledge of your coaches. What's your take on where he might go draft day and maybe even in keepers? Well, I think you've nailed it there, mate. It's pretty much exactly in between what he's capable of because you know, there's going to be some astute coaches that do identify these scores. You know, okay, he went at 76. That includes 48, 7, 23, his lowest three scores in three seasons. But then there's going to be coaches as well that go, oh, 76, he's, he's, that's 20 points down on the season previous. You know, I'd, I'd rather take a punt on on somebody I think is on the way up. Maybe I'll go early on, you know, somebody else. So, Yeah, I think that M5, M6 range is going to be nice and I don't think it's going to burn you either which way. I think there's a lot of potential there for that to to probably head north more than it is south, in fact. I think so. Look, at that point on a draft, you're all looking for upside. Simpkins just a bit more proven than maybe some others are there. There might be a bit more concern about role you might have. Sure, but at that role... And at that spot, I'd really, really happily jump on. Louis, it's been a pleasure to have you on this episode, back on the coaches panel in 2024 and back on the 50 most relevant. Thanks for having me, mate. If you want to go and check out any of the other podcasts or video episodes that we have done, YouTube is the place to go. Subscribe, turn those notifications on is where you can find every single one of these episodes. And in fact, Everything we do this preseason, there's a video output of it as well. You can go and check it out. Wherever you listen to this podcast, whether it be Google Podcasts, Spotify, Pandora, Apple Podcasts, your mum's podcast, we're on every single one of those. If you haven't followed us, given a five-star rating and review, we'd certainly appreciate you doing that. And every single player we reveal in the 50 most relevant doesn't just have a podcast or the audio and video elements. It's also a written article. You can go and check that out at coachespanel.tv. A bunch of other content is dropping through there from all of the different panel members. You'll see them writing stuff right throughout the preseason. In 30 seconds, I've got a quick clue for you who's coming in at number 44. But don't forget all the details for our social media and our Patreon where you can get exclusive exclusive content, early access to these audio podcasts a day ahead, and a bunch of other hidden groups and special content. Our Patreons are getting all of this and more. To join that or to get in touch with us on social media, you can find that in the description of this episode. So who's at number 44 in the 50 most relevant? Let me give you some clues. It's the first dual position player that we're dropping. Not one that might pick it up like Zach Fisher. He actually holds it. As a junior, a fantasy beast. This kid can score. He's priced with incredible value. And we may not have seen drastic amounts of high scoring from him at the elite level, but in the little bits we have, yeah, this guy goes okay. And he could score enough that in his line, he might be one of the most important dual position players you start with. Who is he? You will find out tomorrow in the 50 Most Relevant.